we're going to go through the law of liberty. The law of liberty. And we'll use the integrative evidence-based approach. Scripture tells us in Psalms 119, I, I walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. Notice, God's precepts, his designs, his laws lead us or restore us to freedom. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. As the Lord has his way in our life, he heals us, he delivers us from those chains that bind us, and restores us back into autonomous beings who get the last fruit of the Spirit, and the last fruit of the Spirit is self-control. He restores our freedoms to us. When we violate the law of liberty, now when I present the law of liberty to my patients, many people have never heard of this. I know many of you in here have. But many of my patients have never heard of it, and they don't understand this idea of law. And so I have to tell them, think about the law of gravity for a minute. Because the law of liberty is this kind of a law. Do you have to know about gravity in order for gravity to work in your life? Liberty's like that. You don't have to know about it. It's still working. Do you have to believe in gravity for gravity to work? How about if you deny gravity? You go on top of a building. I refuse it. I deny it. You just made it up and you step off a building. Will gravity care? The law of liberty is like this. You may not have heard of it. You may not know about it. You may deny it. Say, I just made it up. But it's a constant. It's just there. You're either operating in harmony with it or you're transgressing it. And if you're transgressing it, think about gravity. Is it predictable or unpredictable? How many of you can predict what will happen if I let go of this? Only three of you. Okay. And notice that you don't have the gift of prophecy, do you? No. This is a predictable future event when you understand the law. When you understand more of God's laws and how they operate, you can predict things. Law of liberty, when you violate them, three predictable consequences or outcomes are unavoidable unless we restore harmony with the law. I want you to imagine a young man is dating a woman, and after months of dating, this is the woman he wants to spend his life with. She's the one. He takes her out for a special dinner, gets down on a knee, proposes. She has warm feelings for this young man, and, and yet she's not quite sure. So she asks for a little while to think about her answer, and he gets insecure, upset, angry. He stands up. He reaches in his pocket. He pulls out a pistol. He puts it to her head, said, look, I spent time on you. I spent money on you. You better marry me, and you better love me. If you don't, I'm going to kill you. Does she, finally, does she say, finally a strong man who'll take care of me? <laughs> First predictable consequence, when you violate liberty, love is always damaged. See, does she love him more or love him less? Love is always damaged and will eventually be destroyed. It's a design law. It's completely testable, reproducible, same outcome every time. Now, does she want to get closer to this young man or does she want to get away? Violate liberties, a desire to rebel is instilled in the heart. We don't want to stay in relationship now, we want to get away. And if we have the option to leave, in other words, we're not a prisoner of war in a prison camp, we're in a relationship and we have the freedom to leave, but we choose to stay anyway, then a third consequence happens. And that third consequence is individuality is eroded. You slowly lose yourself. You become what I call a shadow person, a person who sees the world through the lens of the one they've surrendered their individuality to. Their, their individuality, their sense of self becomes submerged under the domineering, controlling one. Shirley came to see me, referred by a primary care doctor after many years of depression that hadn't been responding to the antidepressants prescribed by her primary doctor. And then the history is very difficult to get a history. She didn't make eye contact. She had her uh, hands in, in, in between her knees, and she answered most questions with, uh-huh, uh-uh. And it slowly came out that she was in a marriage for 20 years in which her husband physically abused her on a regular basis. And then she told me a story that he wanted dinner ready at five, and she worked and put dinner on the table a little after five. And as he's hitting her, he's telling her, I hate it when you make me do this. Why do you make me do this? If you would have dinner ready on time, I wouldn't have to hit you. I only do this because I love you. And I expressed some disgust at that description of what her husband said. And that's when she made eye contact with me for the first time and said, oh no, it wasn't his fault. If I would have had dinner ready on time, he wouldn't have had to hit me. Was she thinking for herself? 
No, her individuality, having surrendered to this treatment for so long, had been eroded. She is a shadow person. She is only now a shadow of the mind she has surrendered to. And when you ask her questions, well, what do you like to do on weekends? Well, my husband likes to watch football. Well, what's your favorite food? My husband loves spaghetti. She had no sense of self left. It had been erased. An empty shell of a human being. It's an unavoidable, predictable consequence. Now, I'll tell you, before people actually get to the point where they actually lose themselves, it's like being submerged underwater. If somebody holds your head underwater and they're drowning you, before you die, what do you experience? Panic. Panic is normal ex experience when you're being drowned. Many people will go to their doctors experience panic. And if you examine their relationships, not all panic is caused by this. But some panic is caused by the persons in a relationship in which they're being dominated and controlled, their individuality is submerged under the other partner, and they've gotten to the point where if they don't get out, they're going to die and then lose their individuality. I don't mean physically die, lose their sense of self. And oftentimes, imagine you're, you're a, a lifeguard and somebody's drowning, their head's held underwater, you see them flopping, panicking, struggling, and you swim by and say, here's some Xanax to help you relax. <laughs> Is that really helpful to that person? It helps them drown. It helps them die. People whose panic is due to a relationship in which their individuality is being submerged in another, when you medicate the symptom, you actually help them stay in the relationship and lose their self. They have to understand that they don't need a medication. They need their head above water. They need to be free. They need space to be themselves. And then think about your own experiences. Consider when you've been coerced, when you've been threatened. Does it engender more love in you? Or do you get a pushback? Does it incite rebellion? So that's why the Bible says, Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by the way the Spirit works, says the Lord. And the Spirit, how does the Spirit work? The Spirit is the Spirit of truth and love. Truth presented in love, leaving people free. If there is no freedom, there is no love. I will tell you, you can create a robot and put in the most sophisticated computer and you can program it to act any way you want. Even walking into your room three times a day and saying, Master, I love you. You will not get love doing that. If there is no freedom, there is no love. One of the keys to discernment is using the integrative evidence-based approach where you're harmonizing your understanding of Scripture with design law. And so when you read Scriptures, do you harmonize the interpretation with the law of liberty? Many people don't do this, so they'll read a statement where it sounds that there's an authoritarian God saying, do this or else, and they, re and they believe that God doesn't give us real freedom. God is, uh, is, is controlling. God makes his way. He forces it upon us, and if you don't, he'll kill you. Other versions, he wouldn't kill you. Oh, he wouldn't do that. He'll just torture you in hell for alternity. The same problem exists. You cannot get love by threatening to kill, torture, or injure people who don't love you. It's a design law. Does that mean we throw out Scripture? Absolutely not. Scripture is God-inspired, and it reveals truths about God. The problem with Scripture, people have decoupled it from design laws, the laws upon which God runs his universe. And then they interpret it as if his laws are no different than human laws. And they interpret it through this lens of, of imperialism. God runs his universe like Caesar runs Rome. And so when they read things, they misread what they're reading. We tie and discern when we say, wait a second, it can't mean that. Because if it means that, that means we're not free. And if we're not free, we can't love. And if we're, we can't love, then God didn't design us in his image if he's love. So you always start with the question, 
What law lens am I using? What law lens? Am I using the lens of design parameters that the creator God built reality to operate upon, or am I using the idea that God's laws function no different than the laws human beings make up, a system of rules that require external penalty and punishment if you break them? Everything will cascade from that. It will give you discernment with almost every question in scripture and theology. Ask the question, what law lens am I reading this through? This is true about freedom on the physical side of things too. You violate the laws of health, you lose liberty. You smoke two packs a day, you will lose lung function, you will not be able to climb as many flights of stairs, you may eventually be tied down to an oxygen tank, you will not have the same freedoms you used to have. You eat Big Macs and fries three times a day, seven days a week. You will get diabetes, obesity, heart attacks, strokes. You will lose freedoms. There is health only in harmony with God's laws and designs. Break his laws, you become enslaved in some way. Freedom only experienced in harmony with God's design. So key learning points. Law of liberty is a design law. Love only exists in an atmosphere of freedom. Now, some people have suggested, wait a second, what about those people in prison camps or or in concentration camps? Didn't we see love in the concentration camp? Understand, those people did not accept their imprisonment. They rejected it. So in their mind, they remained free and they were looking to escape from it. Understand that they would have gotten away. It's a completely different experience than the person who surrenders to it and accepts the fact that they're underneath and uncontrolled and stays voluntarily in that situation. That's when their individuality is destroyed. All doctrine must harmonize with God's design laws. You will find as we go through this weekend, and one of the things that you'll be, when you really get the design laws in your mind, you will be so effective at parsing and and discriminating uh, uh, the various doctrines that are taught. You can ask really quick questions. I will tell you one of the places to start. If anybody starts a doctrinal discussion with you, first question I do from now on, it always sets the foundation and clears the air. Tell me how you understand God's law functions. If they can't understand the creator God built his universe on laws that operate as constants and never change, if they only understand that, well, it's a system of rules that are holy and righteous and it requires the rule giver to punish the disobedient, if that's their mindset, it doesn't matter. You're wasting your breath. As long as they see God's, it doesn't matter how many Bible texts you show them, how many quotes from other theologians you give them, if they view God's law functioning that way, they will still have imperialistic views of God and see God as the one they need to be protected from. It really comes down to how they understand God's law. Punishment comes from sin, from sin itself. The punishment does, does not come from God. So what's the Bible say? The wages of sin is? Death. Sin when full grown brings forth death. death. Those who sow to the carnal nature, from that nature they reap destruction. And when you understand design law, then you understand, as it says in Corinthians, the sting of death is sin, but the power of sin, the power of sin to destroy is the law. Many people think, well, the power comes from God. God's the destroyer. He kills you for it. No. If you take 50 pound weights and jump in the ocean, tie those to your legs and jump in the ocean, you are now transgressing the law of respiration. What will happen to you? You will die because you're transgressing. But where does the power come from that kills you for that act? Does God send a lightning bolt down to kill you? Does he send an angel down to decapitate you? Does God take, or is it coming from the law itself? Life only exists in harmony with the law of respiration. The power that brings death comes from the law when you're out of harmony with it. That's what it means. The power of sin is the law because the law does not change. It's a constant God cannot change his law to meet sinners in sin, so instead it's like you don't change the law of respiration to meet a drowning man underwater. So what do you need to change? You need to get the drowning man above water. You need to get him oxygen if you're going to save him. So God doesn't change his law. He sent Jesus to change us. 
to restore in us his law, right? My law in your hearts and minds, to put us back in harmony with his design, to bring us life. That was the goal. So it's time for a roundtable discussion. Discuss these things. Understand the power that you have to wield in the discussion when you understand God's design laws.